Good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday, January 5th. Thanks for tuning in to News 3 Now. This morning, I ran across the street over to the Brazos Valley Council of Governments to uh, pay our friends a visit and talk to a couple more program leaders about some of the resources that they offer there. So in just a couple of minutes, we are going to hear from a couple of those program directors. Two really cool programs. The first one is the... Uh, and, I, and I'm blanking on the name, the Student Hireability Navigator Program. What it does is it helps employers and students with disabilities get connected and enter the workforce. Um, so we're going to hear a little bit about that. And then we're also going to hear from the program director of the Adult Education and Literacy Program, which kind of, you know, stands for itself, helps adults get their GEDs. It helps English as a second language students. Um, and offers them some workforce training as well. So we are going to hear from them in just a minute. But first, I want to start with the story that, of course, we are closely following. Seven people, including five kids, are recovering after a house near Tanglewood Park right here in Bryan caught on fire. That's right down the street from where we are. When I was on my way to work this morning, there were still fire trucks outside. They had the street blocked off, some caution tape and some orange cones. So we we're still working to develop more details of that story. But just moments before the show started, we did get a very critical update. Now we updated it on KBTX.com if you want to check it out. The kids have been released from the hospital there is one adult that is still in critical condition following that fire, and that adult has been transferred to a hospital down in Houston. But um, I think we're going to focus on the positive and say that all five of the children have been released from the hospital. Now, like I said, uh, still this morning, investigators are trying to figure out what started the fire in the first place. In case you didn't know it, it started yesterday at about 6.30 p.m. on Carter Creek Parkway. Firefighters say it appears the fire started in the kitchen or maybe the living room area. And like I said, we just got that update that all five of the kids are released from the hospital, but one adult is in critical condition and that adult was transferred to a hospital down in Houston. I heard some children yelling. And so there was kind of some tension. I didn't know what was going on. Uh, looked over here uh, across the creek and saw kids coming out the front door. And I heard a dad that sounded like he was pretty uh, frantic. Well, the Red Cross was called to help the family. Firefighters say it may be several days before the family can come back to the house, if really at all. Well, hey, this is a story that I want to tell you about right now because the blood drive is happening as we speak. And we talked a little bit about this yesterday. The American Red Cross says that our region right here in the Brazos Valley and our entire country are facing a severe blood shortage. Now, a blood drive is being held today until 3 o'clock this afternoon at the American Red Cross Brazos Valley office in Bryan. We have an uh, increase in pandemic levels, and so uh, uh, our, some of our donors are not able to give as they regularly do. So it's really important that those who are able to give uh, go ahead and commit to, to coming in, in in the winter months specifically. Well, during much of the pandemic, the Red Cross has not been able to host drives to collect these life-saving donations. And let me tell you about a road closure in College Station starting today. Traffic alert, it's going to affect a lot of College Station drivers. Starting today, there will be several road and lane closures around FM 2818 and Welburn Road. TxDOT is working on some water lines. Northbound 2818 will be reduced to one lane in the area. The ramp from Wellborn to northbound 2818 will be closed. Jones Butler will also be closed at 2818, as well as the U-turn for Jones Butler. All roadways are expected to reopen before January 17th. So heads up if that is your normal route to school, to work, wherever you're going. 
All right, y'all. So like I said, this morning I headed over to BB Cog and said hello to my friends over there. Talked to a couple more awesome program directors about some of the resources that BV Cog and the Workforce Solutions offers to our community at no cost at all. So first I want to introduce you to Barbara. She's going to be telling us about the Student Hireability Navigator program. They actually have an employer luncheon coming up and Barbara told me that that luncheon is really important for employers who want to tap into the resource of kids with disabilities looking for a job. Now we know that there's a hiring shortage across our entire country and right here in the Brazos Valley. Well, there are students who are ready and able to work. They're looking for jobs and employers. If you want to hire them, this luncheon is a good place to start. So, Miss Barbara, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. We are talking about the Student Hireability Navigator Program. And really, for any of our viewers who might not know about the program, tell us a little bit about it. What do you guys do? Okay, what we do is we work to, um, I, I, to have access for students with disabilities to job opportunities and training opportunities. We also try to provide as many resources to parents for these students so that they can um, just be successful in all the things that they do. And Barbara, why is a program like this important in our community? Well, the students with disabilities, um, you know, we do have uh, uh, quite a few. And uh, what we want to do is we want to make sure that they can be incorporated into the workforce. They'll be a very integral part of it. They can be a very integral part of it. And uh, we need to let employers know that, that, that there's a labor force out there that they can tap into, that uh, that can help them with, you know, like hiring shortages or whatever. And when we're talking about the hiring process, let's talk a little bit about this luncheon that we're going to be having. It's happening on January 11th. Tell us the details first, of course, you know, who can attend, when is it happening, where is it happening, and then kind of what the purpose of it is. Okay, well, the luncheon is um, uh, geared to employers, and uh, it's going to be on January 11th, which is next Tuesday. So we want to invite as many people who are interested in uh, this particular program or any just program that for students with disabilities. And we want to talk about uh, the opportunities that we have for employers who hire these students. We have paid work experience, we have work opportunity tax credits, and we also have different resources that they can um, uh, have access to to help them with students who ha they have on the job. Okay, and so if someone wants to get in contact with you, they see this and they're like, you know what, I have someone in my life that would benefit from this, what's the easiest way to get in contact with you? Well, they can contact me here um, at the uh, workforce. Um, my number is 979-595-2800, uh, uh, and my extension is 2061. Or they could just ask for me, Barbara Clemens. Barbara Clemens, that is your go-to girl if you want to know more about the Student Hireability Navigator Program. And Barbara, I told you this a little bit before the interview, but I'm going to put all of this up on kbtx.com. I'll have links, your contact information. If people see this, they want to get in contact with you. But for right now, is there anything else that you think is important for our viewers to know before the luncheon? Well, the, it's, it's just important to know that, again, I wanted to emphasize that we do have that workforce, that labor force out there. And uh, with all so many hiring shortages, you see, you know, hiring here, hiring there. You know, we do have a workforce that's ready and available to go to work. Absolutely. Well, Barbara, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. So all that information will be up on kbtx.com. I'll include Barbara's information if you want to get in contact with her. That luncheon is happening on January 11th. That was the Student Hireability Navigator Program. Let me introduce you to one more person and one more program. Her name is Ms. Jody, and she is the director of the Adult Education and Literacy Program. Now, of course, if adults need help uh, getting their GED, if there is an adult that uh, speaks English as a second language that wants to learn some more English, now those classes are completely free. They're open to everyone. They not only offer the classes, but they also offer training if you want to enter the workforce. There are a few more qualifications for those courses, but again, offered at no cost. So let me introduce you to Ms. Jody to tell us a little bit more about that program. Okay, so Jody, we are here today to talk about the Adult Education and Literacy Program. For any of our viewers who don't know about the program, tell us about what it is, what you guys do, who's involved in it. 
Okay, awesome. The Adult Education and Literacy Program is run by the Workforce Solutions Brazos Valley Board through a grant from the Texas Workforce Commission. So what that does for us is able to provide um, high school equivalency preparation as well as English as a second language classes across our seven county region. And so we talked a little bit before this about, you know, it's not just the um, English as a second language classes or the GED classes. You guys also provide some training programs. Is that right? That is right. Yes, ma'am. We have workforce training programs um, that we can offer to our students. Um, currently, the classes being offered are construction, uh, facilities maintenance, and certified medical assisting. Um, there is another level of qualification for those particular training classes. However, we're willing to work with you to get you to that point. And so talk to me a little bit about the importance of having a program like this here in our community. I mean, I think a lot of people don't really realize if it doesn't affect them, then maybe they don't know anyone personally who needs the training, who needs these classes, but it's important. Yes, ma'am, it's very important. Um, the uh, training classes are very well attended. It's, uh, it's a definite need in this community to be able to provide workforce training at no cost to participants. I think that, you know, a lot of people um, want to increase their skills at work, but they just don't know how to or don't have the funds to be able to do that. And so through workforce, we're able to provide some no-cost training to them to help them. Um, the, training, the training is there to help them increase their skills so that they can provide better for their families. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about who can participate. I know we talked about the training programs do kind of require that next level of qualification, mm -hmm. but as far as GED classes, ESL classes, anyone can just walk in who needs it, right? That is correct. Anybody can walk in and we will provide services to them. Okay. And so if someone sees this today and they know someone who needs help or they're someone themselves who are like, hey, I'm interested in learning more, where should they go for more information? Yes, definitely should check out our website. It's www.bvjobs.org. Um, there's an information uh, form that you can fill out that somebody will give you a call and discuss your options or give you more information as needed. Okay, awesome. And Jody, anything else that you want people to know um, I know it's open enrollment for some of the training courses. Um, we're going to send them to the website, but just for right now, anything else you want our viewers to know about? Yes, definitely. Uh, if you are uh, somebody in our seven-county region that definitely needs to um, increase your skills or complete your high school equivalency, then please, please give us a call because we're so ready to help you. Well, Jody, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so the Adult Education and Literacy Program, that's another one over at Workforce Solutions and BVCOG, just down the street from us here at KBTX. Again, I'll put all of that information up on kbtx.com after the show today. Well, hey, College Station is getting closer to tearing down their old city hall. Work is underway to remove electrical wiring and do asbestos abatement. Demolition of the old building is expected to start in a few weeks, at least by early February. The site will then be turned into a green space for the public to enjoy. The goal is to try to have that completely taken down by the end of March. And uh, that way uh, we can start to clear the area. It will become a grassy area for now. Um, you know, we do have some ideas for future plans. Well, the city hopes to have work finished around City Hall by football season. Demolition is only expected to take a few weeks once it begins. Well, let's go a little bit broader now. We started in the Brazos Valley, but let's go Texas statewide now. The FBI is following a new lead in the case of Lena Kill. Remember her, that's the three-year-old from San Antonio who's been missing since before Christmas. News outlets there down in San Antonio say a dive team has been called to search a creek two miles from where the toddler disappeared. Her mother reported her disappearance after briefly leaving her alone at an apartment complex playground. She says when she came back, her daughter was gone. The police chief said that there could be possible suspects connected to the case but details are limited. Houston police have launched an internal affairs investigation into the department's response time of a New Year's Day shooting. 
The victim of the shooting is George Floyd's four-year-old niece, Ariana Delane. Her father said multiple bullets hit their apartment. He said police didn't arrive until more than four hours later. The girl's mother drove her to the hospital where she had emergency surgery and remains hospitalized. Police say they don't have a suspect or motive in this case. In Illinois, three teens are facing attempted murder charges after a shooting in the parking lot of a high school. Investigators say two 17-year-olds were shot in a parked car and taken to the hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. The three teens suspected in the shooting were all caught. Police are calling it a targeted shooting. Well, if you're watching now, then you see a little bit of snow in Illinois. Let's talk about the snow on the East Coast. The traffic nightmare on Interstate 95 in Virginia is finally over. This was the scene for most of the day yesterday. Now, the Virginia Department of Transportation says there are no more drivers stranded along a 50 mile stretch of the highway outside the D.C. area. Hundreds of drivers were stranded for more than 24 hours because there was too much snow for crews to keep up. State police say there are no reports of deaths or injuries. Thank God. Well, hey, it's about that time. Let's talk about the COVID-19 pandemic. This is a new story for both myself and for most of our viewers. For nearly two years, we've been hearing how important it is to mask up to prevent COVID-19 from spreading. Well, with this new rapidly spreading Omicron variant, experts say cloth masks do not cut it anymore. Wendy Gillette has what you need to know to protect yourself and others in this unprecedented surge. With the highly transmissible Omicron variant surging across the country, Experts say it's time to upgrade the cloth mask. The typical cloth mask might be 50% effective, and that was okay before. It doesn't seem to be enough with Omicron. We have special masks called respirators, such as an N95, that offer much greater protection. They're able to block 95% of particles that are either going out of your mouth or that you're breathing in. Dr. Lindsay Marr with Virginia Tech studies how viruses move in the air. She says other respirators are also widely available. Things like a KN95, which is a Chinese version of an, the US N95. It has ear loop straps and it's made out of a special material that's very efficient at filtering out particles. It also is designed to fit closely to your face. There's a South Korean version called a KF94 that um, some people call the boat shaped respirator. Reply surgical masks can also help prevent contact with infected droplets. There are ways to really improve the performance of a surgical mask by improving its fit. One way is to use some little um, kind of clips or toggles on the ear loops so that you can tighten it up um, so it pulls closer to your face. The fit is critical for all of these masks to ensure the strongest possible protection. What you need is to have a good seal, especially around your nose, and you want to make sure there aren't gaps at the sides of your cheeks or at your chin. As for kids, Dr. Marr says also choose a good mask that's comfortable with good fit and filtration. Some respirators are designed for kids, but N95s are not designed for younger children. Wendy Gillette, CBS News, New York. Well, when we're looking to buy some new masks, it's important to check that a regulating body in the United States, Chinese or Korean government has approved what you're purchasing. Counterfeit KN95 respirators are pretty prevalent and the CDC maintains a list of brands that are selling those counterfeit masks. Well, Governor Abbott is suing President Biden and his administration over the vaccine mandate for National Guard members. The governor's lawsuit says the policy is unconstitutional and infringes on his authority as commander in chief over the state's militia. The lawsuit says the mandate will lead to the loss of hundreds of unvaccinated guardsmen, inevitably causing harm. 
President Biden says the government will double its order of Pfizer's antiviral COVID pill. He says 20 million treatment courses will be delivered in the months ahead. These pills are going to dramatically decrease, or decrease hospitalizations and deaths from COVID-19. They're a game changer and have the potential to dramatically alter the impact of COVID-19, the impact it's had on this country and our people. While Biden said the pills will be delivered in the coming months, the exact timeline is not immediately clear. Over in Florida, a hospital is shutting down an entire department because of a COVID outbreak. Holy Cross Health in Fort Lauderdale says labor and delivery is closing until further notice because of a critical staffing shortage. The NICU and postpartum departments, however, are still open. Well, this was breaking news I heard on the radio this morning. Chicago public schools canceling classes today because the teachers union is refusing to show up. Late last night, the Chicago teachers union voted to switch to remote learning. Chicago has rejected a district wide return to remote instruction, saying it's bad for learning and mental health. The union argues the district's COVID safety protocols are lacking for both teachers and students, make them vulnerable to catching the virus. The status for instruction for the rest of the week remains in limbo. Well, the CDC is signing off on two measures authorized by the FDA. They are recommending shortening the amount of time between your second Pfizer vaccine dose and your booster shot from six months down to five. The agency did not change the intervals for Moderna or Johnson & Johnson. The CDC also recommended that kids aged five to 11 with weakened immune systems receive an additional dose 28 days after their second Pfizer shot. Let's talk about isolation guidance because whew, it has been a confusing week or two with the CDC. The CDC is updating its isolation guidance for infected people. Experts say they should get a rapid COVID test near the end of a five day isolation period. If the test is positive, they should remain isolated until 10 days. After the onset of symptoms, the CDC also shared evidence that the Omicron variant is up to three times more infectious than Delta. Well, according to another study from the CDC, pregnant women who receive a COVID vaccine do not face an increased risk of preterm births or low weight babies. Researchers studied both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. The scientists say the findings were consistent and they did not find a link between the vaccines and those conditions. There was not enough data to analyze risks of the J&J &J vaccine. The CDC recommends all pregnant women to get vaccinated. Well, here in Brazos County, daily new cases are approaching record levels. Let's check out our dashboard. Everything up today. 275 new cases being reported by the health district, bringing our total number of active cases up to 1,374. Hospitalizations also on the rise. Yesterday we had 30, today we have 32 Brazos County residents hospitalized with COVID-19. That makes up for just over 12% of all hospitalizations here in Brazos County. Well, if you need to take a COVID-19 test, I told you this yesterday, it's really important. Curative is not accepting walk-ups at its locations in the Brazos Valley. You have to make an appointment. But there is also testing available by a different company. There are two locations for that. It's one on Woodville Road in Bryan and another Texas Avenue near Planet Fitness in College Station. And if you need more information on where you can get tested for COVID-19, we have that page up at kbtx.com. 
Well, the physical impact of COVID has devastated hundreds of thousands of people here in the U.S., but there's also been a much more subtle impact, mental health, and that's been showing up in kids as they try to navigate their way back to in-person learning. CNN's Elizabeth Cohen has the details. Like other families, the Kitleys in Chicago were thrilled when last fall their four children could finally go back to school. But halfway through the school year, there have been bumps in the road, leaving home, going back to school. That transition back to school has been difficult, mostly for my youngest child, who felt this sense of safety and security from the age of seven until eight and a half, and then needing to go back to school. So it sounds like your daughter got used to having the comfort of having mom and dad around all the time. Absolutely, and then the, is expected to just go back to school from zero to 100. There wasn't a, a gradual transition. Kidley, a therapist herself, sees the tension in her patients. They are feeling increased anxiety around just how to be and communicate with people and build friendships and being able to feel comfortable in their environment. Have you seen children hit crisis points. Low self-esteem and low confidence and um, feeling depressed and as a coping mechanism turning to eating disorder behavior or cutting behavior and really not being able to manage the intensity of being back in a school environment. Last month, the U.S. Surgeon General issued this 53-page advisory outlining how the pandemic has had an unprecedented negative impact on the mental health of children. One global study finding symptoms of youth depression and anxiety doubled. I'm so concerned about our children because there is uh, an epidemic, if you will, uh, of mental health challenges that they've been facing. Kitley says an empowerment group for girls that she started has helped. See you later. Atlanta area counselor Tisha Stovaldula says when children feel overwhelmed by the transition back to school, she offers them a safe place. They'll often come to my office just to get a break from the noise. And I was very surprised by that, that they needed to come and get a break from the noise. Her advice to parents, remember that if your children seem immature for their age, there's a reason. They missed out on more than a year of development with their peers. I mean, my 12 year old they still act so young. They're more like elementary school kids. Missing a year to a year and a half of social interaction for a middle school student, that, that's a lot. It was a lot. And be patient with your child as they transition from one way of life to another. Their world was turned upside down. As adults, we are able to um, bounce back quicker, usually faster. But for them, you know, it's going to take a little more time. And of course, many children have also faced uncertainty about their learning environments as they switch between in-person and remote learning when COVID surges. Talks have stalled in Congress as lawmakers discuss whether businesses need additional COVID-19 relief. A bipartisan group of U.S. senators is looking at another possible economic stimulus package focused on businesses that have been impacted by the pandemic, including restaurants, gyms, and performance venues. The discussions have been ongoing since cases of the Omicron variant started to spike late last year. Whether any bill can even make it to a committee remains to be seen. Talks in the Senate are currently shelved, and a House aide says none of its lawmakers are in serious discussions on the matter. A senior White House official also said they're not looking at another stimulus, but something small could be done for restaurants. Well, meanwhile, the Biden administration's infrastructure coordinator wants all U.S. governors to appoint their own state infrastructure coordinators. Implementation of the trillion dollar spending bill is a top priority of the White House ahead of this year's midterm elections. He suggested they create their own infrastructure task forces to facilitate the implementation process and to avoid delay. Well, I'm gonna take you live to the Capitol building in Washington, DC now. 
Tomorrow will mark one year since the January 6th assault on the U.S. Capitol. Capitol Police say they are better prepared to handle an attack on the Capitol today than they were one year ago. Officials say the attack exposed flaws in the security system. Since then, there have been more than a dozen reports with more than 100 recommendations on how to better protect the buildings and lawmakers. Intelligence, operational planning, and um, getting the, our civil disturbance unit up, up to where it needs to be were the three biggest issues. And those are the ones that we worked on first, and those are the ones that, frankly, are, are largely completed. Capitol Police say several events are planned for Thursday, but there are no credible threats as of right now. Attorney General Merrick Garland is set to give an update today on the Capitol insurrection, insurrection investigation nearly one year after the attack. Now remember, on January 6, 2021, hundreds of former President Trump's supporters stormed the Capitol building trying to stop lawmakers from certifying the presidential election. 700 people have already been arrested. About 70 have been sentenced. Hundreds more offenders are still at large. It's the largest FBI investigation in history. Still, questions remain on what role Trump and his political allies played leading up to that day. During his update, Garland is set to reaffirm the Justice Department's commitment to defending American democracy from violence. Well, the January 6th committee chairman wants to speak with former Vice President Mike Pence. Representative Benny Thompson wants Pence to talk about what he witnessed that day and the conversations he was a part of in the days leading up to it. Thompson added that the panel has not officially asked Pence to speak with them, but did not rule out asking him in the future. Well, this was some big news yesterday. The House panel investigating the Capitol insurrection has requested an interview with Fox News personality Sean Hannity. Hannity is one of former President Trump's closest allies in the media. According to a letter, the panel wants to question Hannity about his communications with the former president, Mark Meadows, and other days surrounding the insurrection. Hannity has declined to comment, but his lawmakers and his lawyers say they're reviewing the letter and will respond as appropriate. Well, breaking news nationwide, North Korea has reportedly fired another ballistic missile. That's according to the South Korean military. The news comes on the heels of a North Korean missile test back in October. This newly launched missile appears to have landed in the sea. The launch came just hours before South Korea's president helped break ground on a rail line that he hopes will one day connect the two nations. NATO plans to hold a special meeting with Russian officials on January 12th in Brussels. According to a NATO spokesman, all ambassadors and top Russian officials are invited. He says both sides want dialogue to prevent open conflict over Ukraine. NATO will also hold a virtual meeting of NATO foreign ministers this Friday, January 7th. Russia's military buildup in and near Ukraine are on the agenda. All right, this is a super cool story that I saw this morning. I wanted to share with you all. Women athletes are breaking down barriers all over the world. In Japan, professional sumo remains one of the last sports of male domination. Well, a number of recent scandals have changed attitudes toward the sport recently. CNN's Don Riddell reports on how a number of young girls are trying to wrestle their way in. This is sumo, the national sport of Japan. Their wrestlers are hard to miss with their top knots and iconic loincloths, their hulking bodies and high impact bouts. It's an ancient sport dating back more than a thousand years and through all that time very little has changed. As a professional sport, women have always been banned. <laughs> Like, 
Some people think that sumo is just for men, but I want other girls to know that it's really fun and they should definitely give it a go. 12-year-old Nikori Hara loves sumo, but her opportunities to train and compete are limited. So, girls like Nikori also compete in judo and wrestling, often sparring against boys as well as girls. Men can become professional sumo wrestlers, but that's not an option for women at the moment. It would be great if the same opportunities could exist for women in the future. But changing attitudes in Japan mean there might now be a future for girls and women in sumo. Sena Kajiwara has been learning sumo since she was eight years old. And she's not just preparing to knock over her opponents in the dokyo, she's also ready to topple the barriers to entry of a male-dominated sport. There are some people who don't get why I do sumo, but I'm not bothered by what they think. If you want to do sumo, you should do it. I think if we get more girls and women in sumo, then we'll be able to level the playing field and make a living from sumo. I hope that happens. A number of scandals in recent years have tarnished the reputation of Japan's national sport. In 2018, when a city mayor collapsed in the ring, the women who were trying to save his life were asked to leave. According to tradition, the supposedly impure women would pollute the sacred space of the dokyo. The man's life was saved, but the incident sparked a backlash in Japan, prompting the Japan Sumo Association to apologize. The following year, the inaugural Wanpaku Girls National Sumo Championship was held in Tokyo. The event has been open to boys since 1984, but only now are girls aged between 8 and 12 getting their shot. Sena Kajiwara is the defending champion. Sumo is Japan's national sport. Sena can be quite taciturn and earnest. The tournament can be determined in an instant. I think sumo suits her character. Sometimes I hurt myself, but I don't get scared at all when I'm in the ring. Juan Pagu was emceed by established sumo wrestlers, including Hiori Kon, the subject of a recent Netflix documentary, who has competed internationally. Despite her success, though, she can't compete professionally and earn a living. But she says things are changing. This competition didn't exist when I was a girl. It's amazing that we've gone from having nothing to one, then two tournaments. These girls have so much potential. I want to help ensure these efforts are properly recognized in the future. I'm glad my daughter can immerse herself in the world of sumo and enjoy herself. She doesn't have to think about becoming a professional. If the effort she's putting into sumo takes her along that path, that's great. But if it transfers to something else, then I'm happy. Meanwhile, Senna is certainly showing that she's got what it takes. The 12-year-old made it to the final of Wanpaku in 2021, but looked as though she was on the brink of defeat. However, she turned it around and successfully defended her title. I was so nervous before the tournament. I won the championship when I was in fourth grade, so I felt a lot of pressure and expectations this time. In the future, I want to keep up sumo and go as far as I can with it. Don Rodell, CNN. I think that is pretty darn cool. And sumo wrestling is not something that I would have thought, hey, are women participating in that? I just had no idea. I had no idea. I thought that was a pretty awesome story. Wanted to share that with all of you. You know what else is awesome? Today is the day. Oh my gosh, we have been waiting for so long. Big Shots Golf Aggieland is finally 
open. Yesterday, they held a special preview tour for the media and a friends and family event. Brazos Valley this morning was the first to get a peek of the new two-story facility at Bryan's Midtown Park. The company is already partnering with area charities and having a huge impact on our economy. Everybody wants to come here and have fun. We want them all to feel like a big shot. We've got skill-based games for the golfers with TrackMan radar technology, and then we've got some non-skill-based games of chance that the kids love, and then you can always just hang out in our sports bar or play out front in the yard or on the putting course. Well, Big Shots is open today until 11 p.m. So like I said, today is opening day. They're having a big celebration party on Saturday if you want to check that out as well. I, for one, cannot wait to go putt, to hit some balls, to eat and drink. Oh, it's finally open and it's going to be so, so fun. Speaking of food, you know that around this time is when I tend to get really hungry so I start to just talk about food. Well, we're gonna talk about food. We're all gonna, also gonna talk about New Year's resolutions. Now, it might not feel like it. It already feels like uh, next November to me, but we are just five days into 2022. So a lot of us are still sticking to our New Year's resolutions and a lot of people's New Year's resolutions have to do with eating healthier. And most often it's easier said than done, right? You can write down what you're gonna do, what you're gonna eat, but life gets in the way. You get busy, you forget to eat breakfast, you can forget to pack a snack. Something at work is convenient for you to grab that's maybe not the healthiest. For example, yesterday I grabbed a cookie. I am not guilty of eating that cookie, feeling guilty about eating that cookie, but I'm just saying life gets in the way. But to help us out with our New Year's resolution of eating healthier, News 3's Fallon Appleton talked with a dietitian. We are five days into 2022 and many of us are setting resolutions for this new year and to help us kickstart how we are going about healthy eating is registered at dietitian Taylor Leahy. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello. So talk a little bit about how we should really kind of go about jumping start into this healthy eating mindset. What do you best recommend? Yeah, so sticking to good portions is a huge one. So trying to get half of our plate non-starchy veggies, whatever kind you like, a quarter whole grains and a quarter lean protein will set you up for success. And then is there a way that you can ever overdo it where it's actually doing more harm than good? So going too much too quickly it could cause some issues. So if you're not used to eating, say, fiber, enough fiber in your diet, which everyone needs a little more fiber than we think, um, doing it all at once is going to probably cause some GI issues. So slow and steady over the next about two weeks will help you kind of adjust to getting some extra fiber in your diet. And then what about mindful eating? Is there a time that we should be eating versus not or like an environment? Yeah, so we need to eat when we're hungry. Um, if you're if eating three meals a day like a breakfast, lunch and dinner doesn't fit you, that's okay. Eat when you're hungry. Um, when we're sitting there watching TV or sitting there scrolling our phone on Facebook, you know, we're not really paying attention to our hunger cues. We're not paying attention to the serving of food in front of us and suddenly we realize, oh, I ate the whole thing. You know, what did I, am I still hungry? Am I not? So trying to not be distracted when we're eating can really help just by focusing on your meal, sitting down and enjoying it, savoring it, taking it slow you will tend to overeat less if you do it that way. All right, well, thank you so much for all of this great information when it comes to portions and just exactly what we're putting into our bodies, really mm -hmm. helping kind of kickstart everything for us as we head into 2022. If you want more information on ways that you can really work to eat healthy this year, we've got this all up for you over at kbtx.com. Like I said, great advice from a dietitian, but a lot of that is easier said than done. Sitting down with no distractions, knowing your portion sizes, a lot of that is really difficult, but if you are really dedicated to that New Year's resolution, you really want to make a healthy change for yourself this year. Like Fallon said, you can find more information at kbtx.com. And while we're talking about food, because it's almost lunchtime, have you ever seen a meal, and I mean a picture of a meal, like on TV or something, that looks so good that you just want to, you know, grab it off of the screen? Well, a new Japanese invention could let you enjoy a luxury almost as good as that. A Japanese professor has created what she calls Taste the TV. 
She uses a prototype lickable TV screen that can imitate food, food flavors. So here's how it works. The screen contains 10 flavor canister that sprays a combination to create the taste of a particular food. And it's also not as expensive as you may think. It only costs about 875 US dollars to put together. Potential applications for the machine include distance learning cooks, along with tasting games and quizzes. Okay, I have to say, initial thought, here's what I thought of. Have you seen Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory? Because there is a scene where the kids are in a room with wallpaper that has fruit on it and they lick the walls, right? And Veruca says, snozberry, what on earth is a snozberry? Right, you know what I'm talking about. That's what this reminds me of. Licking a TV screen sounds disgusting, but if I could taste those pancakes and uh, stay fit and not have the calories, right? I don't know. I mean, that might kind of tie into our New Year's resolution. We still have to eat, but if I could, you know, eat broccoli and then really quickly lick the screen and taste ice cream, and so I'm eating the broccoli, but it tastes like ice cream, I'd be okay with that. Pretty cool invention. All right, I have been telling you about this every single day because I want at some point today, tomorrow, next week, I want one of my News 3 Now viewers to call me and tell me I just won the Powerball jackpot. And a lucky person could make history. Let it be one of us, please. The lottery says that its jackpot is now worth $610 million. That's Powerball's seventh largest jackpot ever. The drawing for it happens again tonight. Well, it's been three months and 39 drawings since someone has won the jackpot. Powerball does say that the odds of winning are about one in 292 million. But hey, if someone's gonna win it, why not one of us? Best of luck if you buy a ticket. All right, y'all, we're about 10 minutes away from taking our break, but I've got a couple of pretty fun, pretty cute stories to share with you guys. We'll talk about a little bit more uh, news and of course, some more fun stuff after the break, but let me show you a couple of these stories that I am talking about right now. Okay, so first and foremost is this. It is a team builder in Germany who used about 700 sheep and goats to form the shape of a COVID-19 vaccine syringe with food placed on the ground to kind of lure his animals into place. The man said he wanted to spread the message about getting vaccinated. So let's check this out. It's pretty cool. Here are all the sheep and goats. Now there's the food and he's lining them up. Those are some pretty well-trained animals, if you ask me. All right, we're getting there, we're getting there. 700 sheep and goats. It's just mayhem right now. But they're going to zoom out here in a second and we can see there it is. The COVID-19 vaccine syringe. Go get vaccinated. That was this sheep herder's message. Pretty creative if you ask me. Talk about a good way to advertise for something that you're passionate about. Use 700 sheep and goats. I think most more of us should uh, start doing that. Well, hey, this is a funny video that I saw as well. All right, so this person, uh, he's a TikToker and he has this really funny method for scaring off spam callers. Who wants to talk to someone calling about spam? None of us. Well, we could use this guy's method. Hello. Thank you for calling the CIA. You've reached our scam and fraud division. All of our agents are currently assisting other callers. To further assist you, please hold while we download your incoming and outgoing call logs to be analyzed against our database of known scam and fraud operations. An agent will be with you shortly. That's what I thought.
Hello. Thank you for calling the CIA. Hello. Thank you for calling the CIA. You've reached our scam and fraud division. All of our agents are currently assisting other callers. To further assist you, please hold while we download your incoming and outgoing call logs to be analyzed against our database of known scam and fraud operations. An agent will be with you shortly. I gotta hand it to that guy. That is pretty creative. I have never heard of something like that. So instead of answering and saying, you know, hello, and no, I don't want to talk to you, this guy answers it and says, this is the CIA. <laughs> he says all of your call logs are, you know, being recorded, and that's hysterical. I love that. I love that. All right, y'all. Well, this year's Golden Globe Awards will go on at least sort of. David Daniel has that and more in today's Hollywood Minute. The Golden Globes return to the Beverly Hilton Hotel on Sunday, but the event will not be televised and there'll be no red carpet, no audience, and no nominees or other stars. Only Hollywood Press Association members and some of their grant recipients. Variety reports the Globes reached out to several Hollywood agencies to see if their clients would take part but no celebrities agreed to do so. The HFPA was rocked by scandal last year, including allegations of corruption and the revelation the group had no black members. The truth is that I drink a lot, and sometimes I mix it with pills. And I'm here because I woke up this morning convinced I'd witnessed a murder. Here's your first look at Kristen Bell in a spoof of such thrillers as The Woman in the Window and The Girl on the Train, a Netflix series titled The Woman in the House Across the Street from the Girl in the Window. Bell is also an executive producer on the parody mystery series, which debuts January 28th. Or does it? In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. Interesting, 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 interesting. Well, hey, if you did not watch the Aggie men's basketball game last night, we are going to watch about the last 10 seconds of the game. I think it's going to make your whole day. It definitely made mine when I watched it last night. started the backcourt there's just a little bit of a sliced screen to get Williams freed up watch the screen right here we go here we go watch the screen watch the screen three points and we win that buzzer beater by Williams defeated the Georgia Bulldogs last night 81 to 79 That was pretty darn awesome. That three-point buzzer beater by Marcus Williams crushed it. So awesome. Made my whole night when I saw that. We beat the Georgia Bulldogs with that shot. So awesome. All right, well, what started seemingly as a lost dog on a bridge ended as a heroic rescue thanks to the clever canine. Jeremy Roth has today's Take a Look at This. Police officers' discovery of a dog wandering on a New Hampshire bridge was just the beginning of an amazing and heroic rescue. Responding officers tried to corral the Shiloh Shepherd, but says she kept running away toward these damaged guardrails. It turns out, they say, she was leading them to the scene of an accident. They discovered a, a truck which had been overturned with uh, two gentlemen that were ejected from the vehicle. One of the injured was the dog's owner, Cam Laundrie. We shook him up, didn't know what was happening, and next thing you know, the cops were there, and it was all because of her. Both men were treated for injuries and hypothermia, and authorities say throughout the ordeal, the dog, named Tinsley, never left her owner's side. She's my little guardian angel. It's a miracle. 
A do-gooder's good deeds gone viral led a community in Tennessee to save the day for their very own friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. It started with Steven Strickerhausen seeing pictures of the costumed superhero, played by 18-year-old resident Isaiah Brooks, surprising kids, visiting hospitals, and spreading smiles on street corners. It's like, man, this kid's pretty cool. He's doing a lot of cool stuff. I reached out to his mom, asked if there was anything that he needed, and she said, you know, he could use a a tune-up on his car. County residents started collecting donations and within two weeks raised $20,000, enough to buy a new car for their very own hometown hero. I think it's awesome. Uh, I don't know how to thank the community enough. Or take a look at this. I'm Jeremy Roth. Gotta love those feel-good stories, huh? All right, we got one more before the break. These dancing dads are raising awareness about men's mental health and taking talk by storm. Check this out. Out of Puff Daddies, the all-dad dance crew in the UK, they are awesome! Promoting men's mental health. Oh my gosh, you guys have no idea how much I love this right now. This is amazing. They all have their nicknames on the back of their shirts. The Out of Puff Daddies. They even managed to keep things going during the pandemic. Look at them, they are zooming. Here they each are doing the dance in their own room. <laughs> I am for sure giving them a follow, I'll tell you that much. This is one of the best stories I've ever seen an all dads dance group that creates viral TikTok dances to promote men's mental health and destigmatize talking openly about feelings and wow, 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 wow. I'm blown away by this group of guys. And you know what, they're pretty good too. All right, that just made my entire day. I had, you know, read a little bit about this, but I had not watched that video. How adorable is that? A group of dads in the UK taking TikTok by storm to raise awareness about men's mental health. And it looks like they have a really, really good time with it as well, which makes it even better. I love watching stuff that, you know, makes other people of disparate difference in other people's lives but you can tell that those people are also super passionate and having a good time doing it i love that story all right y'all well it is that time it is now 12 o'clock which means it's time to pop on over to your tv and watch kbtx news at noon but we will be back here on news 3 now in just 30 minutes a little bit more news and a couple more fun stories to end our wednesday so i will catch you right back here in 30 minutes. See you soon.
Hey y'all, happy Wednesday, January 5th. We are back here on News 3 Now. Ooh, I just finished my salad that I brought for lunch. It was yummy and I'm feeling totally refreshed and ready to get the show on the road and uh, just get, a, get this Wednesday over with. You know what I mean? It's hump day. It is uh, the, the fifth day of the year. We've got New Year's resolutions we're trying to stick to. There's a lot going on for the first day of the year. So for the first five minutes or so here, we're just going to do a quick recap of some of our news headlines for anyone that have missed, might have missed it. Uh, I'm going to reintroduce you to our friends over at Brazos Valley Council of Governments, uh, show you one more cute little story, and then we'll say goodbye. Sound good? All right. Well, I'd like to uh, give you guys kind of a rundown of what we're going to do in case you need to pop in and out at any point. So let's start with a look at some of the headlines. So we're going to start right here in Brazos County right here in Bryan, right here actually down the street. So we're working to find more updated details about a house fire that happened down the street just north of Tanglewood Park yesterday evening at about 6.30. Seven people, including five kids, were taken to a hospital. Now, we learned as of this morning that all of the children have been released from the hospital. One of the adults is in critical condition and was transferred down to a hospital in Houston. But like I said, we have KBTX crews out and about today working to gather some more details. I do believe there is a GoFundMe that has been set up for the family. I also believe they're going to be doing kind of a clothing and hygiene drive down here in Bryan to uh, raise some goods for the family who lost everything in this house fire. Now, of course, uh, I told you this morning when I was driving down the street from my house to work, I actually drove down that street past where the fire happened. There were still fire investigators out there. They kind of had the, the road blocked off. You couldn't get to it. The family is not able to go back to their home right now to collect maybe anything that's salvageable. Um, they're still investigating what caused the fire. They know it started either in the kitchen or the living room. We did talk to a neighbor last night that said he heard shouting and, you know, ran outside to try to see what was happening. We will have more updates throughout the day. Now, this story has just been updated moments ago. We're still trying to figure out um, the condition of the adult who was in critical condition right now. Uh, we had that information earlier this morning. Things may have transpired. And so we're trying to keep you as updated as possible because we want to be able to help this family regather their life after a house fire last night. Now, we're also taking a look at our Brazos Valley COVID-19 dashboard. Everything is back up once again. Now, our new cases, 275 new cases today. That's bringing our total almost to record levels again with over 1,300 active cases, hospitalizations on the rise here in Brazos County and across the entire nation right now. So do your part in keeping yourself and your loved ones safe, mask up in public and go get vaccinated. Now, if you need to be tested for COVID-19, we do have testing location information up at kbtx.com. I told you this yesterday. I'll tell you again one more time that curative, if you go to a curative location, they are no longer accepting walk-ups because of such a high demand. So many people need to be tested right now after the holidays, going back to school. Whatever your reason is, make an appointment. All right, but we've got that and several other locations listed at kbtx.com if you need some more information. Now, one more thing. It's a fun story. It happened last night when our Aggie men's basketball team took down the Georgia Bulldogs in the last five seconds of the game. Marcus Williams hit a three-point buzzer beater to put us ahead of Georgia. We won that game 81 to 79. So big congratulations to our Aggie men's basketball team. That's all over Twitter. If you want to watch that video, it showed you that a little bit earlier today. It was awesome. Totally made my day. Well, hey, let's talk about a couple of the cool resources over at the Brazos Valley Council of Governments and Workforce Solutions. Once a month, I head down the street, talk to some of our friends over there. They have all kinds of resources. Now, in the very beginning, 
when I started doing these interviews, I talked to the president, the director, Michael Parks over at BV Cog, and he told me we have so many resources to help people, but we need people to help. And so this is our way of trying to get viewers to know that there are resources, there is help. If you need help paying your rent, if you need childcare, if you need really anything, go to BVCOG or contact them, go online, tons of resources over there. So two that we're highlighting today, the first one is the Student Hireability Navigator Program. It helps students with disabilities enter the workforce. It also helps employers who are interested in hiring these students get connected with them. And there is a luncheon coming up next Tuesday, January 11th. So I met up with Barbara to talk a little bit more about that program. So, Ms. Barbara, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. We are talking about the Student Hireability Navigator Program. And really, for any of our viewers who might not know about the program, tell us a little bit about it. What do you guys do? Okay, what we do is we work to, um, uh, to have access for students with disabilities to job opportunities and training opportunities. We also try to provide as many resources to parents for these students so that they can um, just be successful in all the things that they do. And Barbara, why is a program like this important in our community? Well, the dis students with disabilities, um, you know, we do have uh, uh, quite a few. And uh, what we want to do is we want to make sure that they can be incorporated into the workforce. They'll be a very integral part of it. They can be a very integral part of it. And uh, we need to let employers know that, that, that there's a labor force out there that they can tap into, that uh, they can help them with, you know, like hiring shortages or whatever. And when we're talking about the hiring process, let's talk a little bit about this luncheon that we're going to be having. It's happening on January 11th. Yes. Tell us the details. First, of course, you know, who can attend, when is it happening, where is it happening, and then kind of what the purpose of it is. Okay, well, the luncheon is um, uh, geared to employers, and uh, it's going to be on January 11th, which is next Tuesday. So we want to invite as many people who are interested in uh, this particular program or any just program that for students with disabilities. And we want to talk about uh, the opportunities that we have for employers who hire these students. We have paid work experience, we have work opportunity tax credits, and we also have different resources that they can um, uh, have access to to help them with students who ha they have on the job. Okay, and so if someone wants to get in contact with you, they see this and they're like, you know what, I have someone in my life that would benefit from this, what's the easiest way to get in contact with you? Well, they can contact me here um, at the uh, workforce. Um, my number is 979-595-2800, uh, uh, and my extension is 2061. Or they could just ask for me, Barbara Clemens. Barbara Clemens, that is your go-to girl if you want to know more about the Student Hireability Navigator Program. And Barbara, I told you this a little bit before the interview, but I'm going to put all of this up on kbtx.com. I'll have links, your contact information. Great. If people see this, they want to get in contact with you. But for right now, is there anything else that you think is important for our viewers to know before the luncheon? Well, the, it's, it's just important to know that, again, I wanted to emphasize that we do have that workforce, that labor force out there. And uh, without so many hiring shortages, you see, you know, hiring here, hiring there, you know, we do have a workforce that's ready and available to go to work. Absolutely. Well, Barbara, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Thank you. And one more program that we want to highlight is the Adult Education and Literacy Program. It's for students who need to get their GEDs. It's for English as a second language students, and it's for people who need help entering the workforce with a little bit of training. The training programs are offered at Blinn College through this program. So Jody has a little bit more information. Okay, so Jody, we are here today to talk about the Adult Education and Literacy Program. For any of our viewers who don't know about the program, tell us about what it is, what you guys do, who's involved in it. Okay, awesome. The Adult Education and Literacy Program is run by the Workforce Solutions Brazos Valley Board through a grant from the Texas Workforce Commission. So what that does for us is able to provide um, high school equivalency preparation as well as English as a second language classes across our seven county region. 
And so we talked a little bit before this about, you know, it's not just the um, English as Second Language classes or the GED classes. You guys also provide some training programs. Is that right? That is right. Yes, ma'am. We have workforce training programs um, that we can offer to our students. Um, currently, the classes being offered are construction, uh, facilities maintenance, and certified medical assisting. Um, there is another level of qualification for those particular training classes. However, we're willing to work with you to get you to that point. And so talk to me a little bit about the importance of having a program like this here in our community. I mean, I think a lot of people don't really realize if it doesn't affect them, then maybe they don't know anyone personally who needs the training, who needs these classes, but it's important. Yes, ma'am, it's very important. Um, the uh, training classes are very well attended. It's, uh, it's a definite need in this community to be able to provide workforce training at no cost to participants. I think that, you know, a lot of people um, want to increase their skills at work, but they just don't know how to or don't have the funds to be able to do that. And so through workforce, we're able to provide some no cost training to them to help them. Um, the training, the training is there to help them increase their skills so that they can provide better for their families. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about who can participate. I know we talked about the training programs do kind of require that next level of qualification, mm -hmm. but as far as GED classes, ESL classes, anyone can just walk in who needs it, right? That is correct. Anybody can walk in and we will provide services to them. Okay. And so if someone sees this today and they know someone who needs help or they're someone themselves who are like, hey, I'm interested in learning more, where should they go for more information? Yes, definitely you should check out our website. It's www.bvjobs.org. Um, there's an information uh, form that you can fill out that somebody will give you a call and discuss your options or give you more information as needed. Okay, awesome. And Jody, anything else that you want people to know? Um, I know it's open enrollment for some of the training courses. Um, we're going to send them to the website, but just for right now, anything else you want our viewers to know about? Yes, definitely. Uh, if you are uh, somebody in our seven county region that definitely needs to um, increase your skills or complete your high school equivalency, then please, please give us a call because we're so ready to help you. Awesome. Well, Jody, thank you so much. Thank you. We'll have all that information for you. If you want to learn a little bit more, all of that will be up at kbtx.com after the show today. All right, y'all, we've got one more story to end News 3 Now today, and it is a good one, and it's one that we all need to hear on this Wednesday, the first Wednesday of the year. Things are kind of like, ah, and I feel a little bit frazzled. So this is what we need to hear right now. This is our last story of the day. Like I said, it's a good one. It's this little girl and her mom reciting positive affirmations. And the mom says that they do this every single morning together. I am beautiful. I am loved. I will be nice. I am strong. And I'm gonna have a good day. Are you gonna have a good day? Yeah. Hey, I love you so much. I am smart. I am strong. I am nice. I am unique. Important. Important. I love myself. I love myself. I am loved. I love it. I love it. I love it. We all need to be doing those positive affirmations with ourselves, with each other, people that we love. We could all use a little bit more confidence. 2022 is going to be a great year for us. Whatever you have your mindset to, you've been 
dreaming about a career change, about buying a house, buying a car, spending more time with loved ones, eating healthier, exercising more, whatever your goal for 2022 is, it's going to happen. I'm speaking it into existence for myself and for all of my News 3 Now viewers. We can do this. This is our year. As always, it's been so much fun hanging out with you guys. I am going to end our show right here for the day. We'll be back tomorrow at 11 o'clock in the morning on News 3 Now. Look, we've got a couple of guests joining us both tomorrow and Friday. So uh, you won't have to listen to me talk for two straight hours. <laughs> There'll be someone else talking a little bit in between. I know that you guys love listening to me talk for two hours, but it does strain my voice a little bit. I'm not going to lie. I need to get like, a little bit of tea in here afterwards. All right, y'all. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your Wednesday, January 5th. Thanks, as always, for tuning into News 3 Now. Like and subscribe to our KBTX YouTube channel so you get notifications whenever I go live. And I'll see you back here tomorrow at 11 o'clock in the morning on KBTX YouTube Live today and every single day from me to you. Remember, you are loved and I'm happy that you're here. Thank you for watching News 3. Local, trusted. Thank you for watching News 3. Local. Trusted.